regarding faith and sex. We tended to get stuck on gays and lesbians, but there was much more in that text. It spoke of right relationships. It spoke of, spoke of marriage and outside. It spoke of self, sex as self-transcending, as spiritual, as divine. But it was very serious in a very churchy way. So that by the end of reading it, I felt compelled to write to them and say, sex is fun. That's why we do it. That's why we do it when you get down to it. And you get down to it when all is said and done. We like sex. Sex is fun. But then I did more reading. I did a taxpayer funded PhD. Thank you to the taxpayers in the room. And I came to the conclusion that I was wrong, you see. But before I tell you more about sexual reality, let me say a little bit about this person, me. People call me Jason. I've honours in zoology. I'm also a minister. I've passed theology. I studied up on evolution to complete my PhD, and I've been a bloke for years, as you can plainly see. So I can say, after years of study and more contemplation, and a little bit of practice and a fair bit of consternation, that sex is fun. But that's not why we do it. It's only fairly recently that evolution grew it. Still, most people would agree when all is said and done that we do like sex. It is fun. Of course, most creatures on Earth don't even do it at all. They just split in half, and then off they crawl. Then homosexuality was the first revolution. There was only one gender for most of evolution. Now we have genders, but there's not just two. Some species have dozens. It's true. And then we have all those whose gender bends in this cycle repeating again and again. Fish girls become boys, become women, become men. In this cycle repeating again and again. And even when our gender stays fixed, things tend to get a little mixed. XO, XX, XXX, XXXX, and XXXX. That's the female sex. XY, XXY, XXXY, XXYY, XXXY. There's all kinds on the male side. And if you think that's a little bit absurd, the whole thing is reversed when we come to birds. I'm XY, but a male bird is ZZ. And there might be combinations that we don't even know about yet. Sea sponges can have sex, or they can do it alone. On a whim, they can mate, or they can clone. Of course, when they do have sex, there's no penetration. They just squirt everything out and hope for fertilisation. Sponges have orgies to an unheard of degree, which might be worth remembering when you swim in the sea. <laughs> Creatures that do penetrate usually have no thumb. Just to survive is the main rule of thumb. Male spiders get eaten unless they're clever. Lots of them only do it once. Most bees do it never. Birds orgasm in the blink of an eye. Antichinus do it for a while and then crawl off to die. But bonobos, the pygmy chip, do it with whomever they can and then they do it again and again and again. Sex seems to be fun for some of the primates, especially bonobos and us hairless but sex is dangerous. You get dead a lot. So why didn't life just say, I'd rather not? Well, sex in all its forms, it seems, has evolved to help us fight off the common cold. Well, really to fight off the more dangerous types of viruses, uh, bacteria, and even parasites. We shuffle the deck when we combine our gametes. It's infection by germs that sex evolved to help us defeat. Sure, we love sex now, and we think it's great, but it started to help us recombinate. If there were no germs, there would be no sexuality. All of this fun came from calamity. All this fuss and ingenuity just to help our species hang around in perpetuity. Mating involves dangers, it involves rituals, it involves mess. Yet humans keep on mating, so we're breeding a bit less. Now, while in drawing morals from evolution would be kind of dumb, so is quoting Genesis, I think, like some God-given rule of thumb. <coughs> You might hear God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But we know that that's rubbish. First, all sex was same sex and didn't life flourish. Often at a wedding, you'll hear that God gave marriage. Again, that sounds to me a bit like Genesis inspired baggage. Evolution took us, but it certainly took a while, and it's not like Western monogamy <coughs> is the only human style. Marriage is great for a stable society. Of course, that's the very thing that Jesus upended. He died a man of notoriety. Yet my wife and I subscribe to it, using contraception. Well, most of the time, there have been two conceptions. A lovely little kid and another one just arrived. The planet's overcrowded, but I'm glad that they survived. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them that. Other friends have no kids, but for many years they were
have tried, and it really doesn't help them when someone says it's for God to decide. Babies come when a sperm makes it to an egg, not when God decides we don't have to be. Now, sex to get our kids was a highlight by none, but we're certainly not having any others, and sex is still fun. It was even more fun after I got the snip. It's lucky that I'm not Catholic, but a Protestant. <laughs> Another thing that could be good, if you want to try and see, is some time short or long of celibacy. Though it's caused its share of problems when the church has enforced it, thinking that the end, of, end was nigh, Jesus and Paul strongly endorsed it. Now I agree that sex is great for a woman, a married woman and a man. My difficulty comes when people say they're the only ones who can. But any ethic which ignores the fact that we've evolved is an ethic which will leave many problems still unsolved. I can't give you all the answers in a silly little poem, and if I tried, it probably wouldn't rhyme, and I can't stand that. <laughs> but love yourself. <laughs> love yourself. Love your neighbour. Do for them as you would have them do for you. Jesus' simple little rules make sex both fair and fun. I can't vouch for bloke to bloke about it many rave, or when there's just women, though for some friends that's the fave. Should you go and have sex? Well, I can't pretend to know. If you haven't started yet, then you should probably take it carefully and slow. Sex should be a lot of fun, but we know it isn't always so. Sex is spiritual and mystical, emotional, relational, luminous, numinous, it's even educational. The Bible has a point when it says it makes us one, even if it started to avoid those pathogens. Thank you very much. really difficult to talk about it, um, and particularly in churches, I find a lot of people tell me that they've never uh, had a conversation or heard a conversation or had anyone try and preach about uh, sexual relationships, and particularly not what it means to, uh, to be a 21st century Christian thinking about these issues. So I hope that humour will kind of carry us through the rest of this talk as well. Just to say a little bit more about myself, just a little turn back on again. Um, I uh, have all kinds of friends. I have atheist friends, agnostic friends, Christian ones, single friends, married friends, divorced friends, single parents, uh, gay, bisexual, straight, creationist, evolutionist, uh, which sounds like I have a lot of friends, but many of them are the same person, so there's not many of them. <laughs> but, um, but I do know people. And myself, I've been an atheist, I've been an agnostic, I've been a creationist, and now I'm an evolutionist. Uh, if you're a creationist, then the first part of this talk probably won't... Uh, connect with you very much, but by the middle I think we will. I've been single, uh, both happy about it and unhappy about it. I've been married and divorced and married again. And I'm talking to a group of people who are kind of uh, 16 to 26 with a range of backgrounds and some chaplains who uh, push beyond 26. A range of experiences, a range of sexual relationships uh, and attractions. And I'm trying to cover 500 or so million years of the development of sexuality, a bit of a survey of the Old Testament and the New Testament and think about today. So as you can see, this is a kind of an ambitious talk. So I'm going to go through some material and my hope isn't to answer all of the questions about what it means to be sexual beings and disciples in the 21st century, but to encourage you to start those conversations and think about how you can have them. And that's uh, part of the reason the chaplains are here. All of them are happy to continue that conversation with you. So the main idea is that sexual relationships evolve, okay? And they adapt to the environment in which different creatures live, including human beings. We live in an environment which is different from our nomadic ancestors for the last couple of hundred thousand years or so. There was more equality in their communities probably and more sharing, including, it seems, sexual activity. I'll say more about all this later. We live in a different environment from the Jews who put the Torah together. They lived in an agricultural, thoroughly patriarchal, okay, male-dominated society where there was constant skirmishing, so men tended to die. We live in a different world from the Christian biblical days who had a strong conviction that the end was nigh and therefore marriage and family and property uh, was all a distraction from the kingdom of God that was coming. We even live in a different environment from our parents. Uh, my mum, as a Protestant, wasn't allowed to date a Catholic. It would have been a horrific thing to do back in the 50s, and your parents were probably in similar situations. So our environment has changed even from our parents' generation, and even from each other. If you were to have a conversation, uh, and I'll give you some parameters for that conversation later, we'll quickly discover that in terms of uh, 
finances, in terms of the attitude to women in leadership, um, careers and a whole lot of other things. We live in different little cultures. So there's not an answer for us today about what an appropriate sexual ethic is. The question is, what's an appropriate one for you? So we need to discern what kinds of relationships and sexual activity best reflects the environment that I live in as I try and follow the way of Jesus in the 21st century. Or at least that's what I'm suggesting to you. How do I love God, neighbour and self in my relationships? How do I do for others as I would have them do for me? The poem talked about the long history of sex and its diversity to get away from the idea that, uh, that uh, creatures and sex kind of spontaneously appeared as two genders of creatures that would go on and breed forever, including humans uh, for whom marriage was the institution from the beginning of time. But I want to focus more on uh, humanity from now on, remembering that human relationships, like all animal relationships, have adapted to their environment. So our creation, our evolved state, it appears, has been mostly as hunter-gatherers with few possessions in small groups, travelling around the world, not having much to do with each other, where cooperation was vital to survive and inheritance was basically meaningless. Our deepest instincts as humans come from this vast period of our life, that yellow and that red period there. So that humans before Homo sapiens and then our species for the last couple of hundred thousand years. This tiny little dot down the bottom is the agricultural era for the last 10,000 years or so, and that spans the entire biblical worldview. So the people who wrote the Bible assumed that agriculture was the human condition. As a counterpoint, Jared Diamond's an ecologist who says that agriculture is actually the disaster from which humanity has never recovered. It led to malnutrition, shorter lifespans, oppressive relationships between men and women, and escalating conflict over resources. So while in the West we tend to talk about agriculture as the first stepping stone in our civilization which separated us from the savages, other people are starting to suggest that maybe that's more like the apple that humanity took and which, uh, from which everything went wrong. I forgot to say at the start that um, at least half of this PowerPoint I've had to hide because of the amount of time we've got together. So if you'd like to see the whole PowerPoint or a couple of book drafts that I'm working on at the moment, one about the evolution of sex and what it means for Christians and kind of the content of today, and another one which is a bit of a more personal story, if you just want to send me an email and I'll put it up there later, uh, jason at ecofaith.org and uh, I'll get back to you with some stuff. So. The basic idea is this nomadic era, most of our history, after a few billion years, humans evolved, and men and women met frequently and had sex, particularly men and women having sex together, but also, if we look at some of our other primates around at the moment, probably uh, females having quite a bit of sex with each other as well. Men, of course, need a bit of a rest after they orgasm, a little tea and a biscuit to recharge, but women can have multiple orgasms, and so it's likely uh, that that's what was going on in these communities. And the idea is that having multiple sexual partners actually built community bonds in these small communities of people that had to cooperate as they tried to survive in a very hostile environment. It meant protection for the females and it meant that everybody shared the care of the children because no one was really sure whose children they were. So very different from the kind of nuclear family we're in now. A very different world from ours. Few or no possessions, much more sharing. I'll come back later and suggest in some ways it's more similar to the kingdom that Jesus was talking about than the society we've created for ourselves now. We get clues from our other primate relatives and our own biology that this is what might have happened. As a quick aside, this is probably a world where sexually transmitted diseases were pretty rare because they appeared with agriculture. But the question some people have is, how could that actually work, everybody having this kind of hippie free sex? Isn't evolution all about competition? And, you know, the males trying to make sure that their genes get through to the next generation and the women doing the same. So the men kind of keeping the women to themselves and so on. Well, yes, there is competition going on, but it's quite different. There's a very good reason to think that for most of our history, the genetic competition that drives evolution happened during and after sex, not before it. So we can look at our ape relatives, for example. Look at gorillas there, the, the uh, gigantic fellow over there. They do live polygamous lives and they do try to keep the females to themselves. And so consequently they have tiny testicles because they don't need to produce much sperm because they're the only one having sex with the women. In gibbons, who are the only monogamous ape that we know about, uh, and actually we now think they're serially monogamous, not uh, lifelong monogamy, again they have very small testicles because if you're living in a monogamous relationship you don't need much sperm to uh, impregnate your partner. 
But bonobos, who are a chimp uh, which seems kind of similar to us in some ways, seem to enjoy sex a lot apart from reproduction. They just have fun having sex and they use it to kind of uh, maintain social bonds in their communities. They have lots of different partners and they have lots of sex and it fulfills this bonding function. They have sex face to face like humans do. Uh, they tongue kiss. Um, the women copulate constantly and tend to be a lot more bisexual than the males. And females are very vocal during sex, so they basically advertise to any other males around that they'll be ready in a moment for them as well. <laughs> and the males have huge testicles, okay, because if you're having lots of sex and your partner's going to go and have lots of sex with other people, you want to produce as much sperm as you can. Where do humans fit in to this part of the story? Whoops. I love the world of touch screens. This one isn't one. Well, as you can see there, human testicles, and I'm sorry this gets a bit biological, but human testicles are much bigger than gorilla ones. They're a little bit smaller than chimpanzee testicles, but they're pretty much up there with the polyamorous species, okay? So they can produce a lot more sperm than we need uh, to get somebody pregnant. And there's good reasons to think that human testicles have actually shrunk in size since the agricultural revolution, uh, partly because of monogamy partly because of the chemicals that are now in the atmosphere that we're all eating, and partly because of our diet. But the penis is much larger, as I'm sure some of you have noticed, than all of the other apes. That's one thing that uh, humans can claim. The human penis is the only one that has the glands on the end, okay, the head. And we have sex for much longer than other primates, okay? Much as they joke about uh, how short uh, men are when we have sex, how quickly we do it, it's a lot longer than it is for other primates. All of this, it seems, is to help uh, you pump out the sperm from the person, from the man who's just had sex with the woman and make more room for your own. It's also known that the first spurt of ejaculate, if this gets too much, block your ears, has chemicals in it which protect the sperm from the previous male sperm. And then the middle few spurts are the actual sperm, and then the last couple of spurts contain chemicals that try and kill off the sperm that's yet to come. So male semen, uh, is composed in a way that suggests that for most of our history we've been having sex with women who have just had sex with somebody else and are likely to quite soon after us. Human women still vocalise uh, during sex. 97% of women report being louder than males are during sex. It's a bit hard to tell because a lot of women unfortunately are also encouraged to fake it and making noise is a way of doing that. But it does seem that female uh, women, that's uh, female women, female humans, <laughs> Uh, are louder during sex and like bonobo females um, yeah, make enough noise that if there were males roaming around in the area that could hear them they would know uh, that there might be um, a liaison just around the corner. So we seem very similar to the other apes who are promiscuous. So it looks something very briefly like this. For 500 million years, males and females actually evolved for the first place. For the last 6 million years or so, amongst primates, there's been this multi-partner mating, communal bonds, shared care of infants, particularly bonobos, for 3 million years or so, and probably our ancestors. Uh, others, like gorillas, are polygamous and uh, gibbons uh, monogamous. So for about 300,000 years, the kind of basic human drives haven't been about trying to stop our partners having sex, but they've been about... Uh, fairly freely shared sexuality on the, and we've been biologically uh, adapted to try and make sure that we're still the ones uh, who are getting our partner pregnant, males have. Mostly egalitarian competitions between sperm, not between males, with free mate choice. But as time has gone on, we see in nomadic societies that became more and more regulated. So there's a lot of nomadic societies where there is still marriage, uh, kind of social marriage, where two people stay together, but they have sexual relationships with others, but it's, it's much more controlled. And then the agricultural environment from about 10,000 years ago in some parts of the world moved to monogamy and polygamy. It's the time the Old Testament was written. Parents started to choose who your mate was going to be. Marriages were closed off, but there was a whole lot of cheating going on, which we see uh, in all the rules trying to stop it. And it was a very patriarchal society. So men were in control of everything. They owned everything, including women and children. A couple of things to pick up on there. Is there actually any modern evidence for the fact that women have this high sex drive? Because the mythology we often hear is that women aren't very into sex and they really only do it to kind of have babies and keep their men around. 
I don't know if you've ever heard that story, but I've heard it quite commonly. It, in a lot of relationship books, it's kind of there, like, yes, I know you're not into it, women, but you know, you've got to put out a bit or you can hardly blame your partner for leaving you. Uh, these are modern books. Uh, and if so, how do we get to the point where women's sexuality is so repressed? Well, obviously orgasm isn't everything there is uh, to sex. It's a lot more fun than that. But in a Christian sexual ethic of in all things do for those what you would want them to do for you, I'd suggest that surely puts it upon men if they enjoy orgasms to make sure that their female partners have just as many as they do. I'd love to hear a sermon based on Matthew 7, 12, but in regard to uh, orgasm. Why control women's sex drive? Well, basically our recent agricultural past and the beginning of property and inheritance. So this is the way evolutionists talk about human sexuality in the agricultural era. So, okay, a new environment, a new kind of sexual relationship. Basically, man meets woman, man and woman assess each other's mate value. So he's meant to be looking for a youthful woman who's fertile, with big hips, a virgin, of course, uh, and someone who's going to be sexually faithful to him. She's meant to be looking for someone with wealth and status and power, someone healthy and someone who's going to hang around and not abandon her. They find that person and they meet and become mates and then he spends the rest of the marriage trying to stop her having sex with anybody else because she might get pregnant but of course being driven by his genes to be as promiscuous as possible to spread his genes around the population. Well she's meant to be driven to uh, stop his emotional infidelity to make sure he doesn't leave but when ovulating to go around looking for some better sperm than he might be able to provide. And there is evidence that women's sexual preferences change depending on where they are in their cycle. And this is often said to be the fundamental nature of human beings, a monogamous species but forever trying to cheat on each other, uh, driven by our genes. Men and women are in constant competition in their marriages, which is a pretty depressing way of understanding marriage. And, but you might recognise it today, it's kind of the basis of a lot of uh, relationship books that are you know, built on the differences between men and women. And it is a dynamic of human relationships, it's a dynamic, but it's not the earliest one. It's not our evolved dynamic. It's been added since the agricultural era. Agriculture, of course, being a way of living that started in the Middle East, just before Judaism uh, really took off. And it's assumed in the Judaic law and creation stories. So here's the story of sex that you'd be familiar with, probably from uh, the Old Testament. God makes a man, God makes a woman. The woman sins, the woman leads the man into sinning. And so God puts men in charge of women from then on. And just to prove the point and drive it home, makes, painful, makes childbirth painful from then on. From that point on, men own women, including their sexuality. Let's have a bit more of a look at the Old Testament and this, this particular context. First, I want to say that there's a lot of positive sexuality in the Old Testament. Uh, this is something you wouldn't be allowed to read unless you were male and over 21 in Jesus' day. It's the kind of sealed section of the Old Testament, the Song of Solomon. Awake, north wind, says the woman, and south wind, come, breathe upon my garden and let its spices stream out. Let my lover come into my garden and taste its delicious fruit. The man says, how fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden, stately as a palm tree, your breasts are like its clusters. I will climb this palm and lay hold of its branches. Pretty hot stuff. <laughs> I thought so in year eight when I found it in the Bible. And many of our church fathers who had very smutty and interesting pasts um, struggled to see how this could be in the Bible at all. They just didn't get it. And so they basically said, this isn't about a man and a woman, it's about God and the church. Um, I invite you, if you want a really good laugh, to read the Song of Solomon as if the man is God and uh, the woman is the church and to see how hysterical it is to have God climbing the branches of the church to pluck its fruit, for example. So Jew uh, Jewish people at that time had a, a, a really um, sensual aspect uh, to their faith and culture, but they were very hung up on other aspects of it, including pregnancy, as we'll see. I spent some time in Queensland and at one point the Queensland Synod of the Uniting Church called on Christians to uphold the biblical norm for sexuality. They presumably didn't mean this. From the seventh generation of humanity, polygamy enters into the Old Testament story. It's the norm for sexual relationships is polygamy, at least for the wealthy, especially if you include concubines and the odd handmaiden as well. 
And because of times of conflict, when lots of men were killed off, it was a way that women could all have a man in their life, and they needed one because it was the men that owned a property. Polygamy was possibly also quite prevalent in the Christian community, uh, leading the author of 1 Timothy to specifically say that bishops and elders should be the husbands of only one wife. We've interpreted, interpreted that as being about divorce, but it doesn't say divorce, and it could quite easily. It's as likely, if not more likely, that it's actually saying that elders and leaders shouldn't be polygamous. It was the norm, but it didn't always go smoothly. Sarah, Abraham's wife, you might remember, took her slave, Hagar, and just gave her to her husband to have kids, but that didn't work out very well. And Jacob, of course, uh, was tricked into marrying Leah, and so he has sex with her and gets her pregnant, but then works for another seven years for her father and gets to marry Rachel, and also goes into her. But, you know, one has children, the other one does, and it leads to all this jealousy and envy. Again, polygamy doesn't work out very well. Maybe it was better than nothing for women in a thoroughly patriarchal society, but they didn't seem thrilled about it. But the biblical writers saw polygamy as being completely morally and socially responsible in their environment, although they acknowledged it wasn't perfect for women. But this context of where it's happening is vital. It's about protecting male privilege and guaranteeing inheritance for their children and a modicum of protection for women, some women. How's this for a biblical norm when it comes to marriage? This is a time when one of the tribes of Judah uh, didn't have enough women to go around and marry, so they invaded uh, the area of uh, Gabash Gilead, put everyone to the sword, including the women and all the children and the men, everyone that wasn't a virgin, and then they took the 400 virgins and gave them to the men so that they could have wives. Men could have sex with their wives, of course, more than one, and their concubines and any other handmaidens that might have come along as long as they didn't belong to another woman, uh, to another man in the first place or weren't worth money to anyone else. So the rape of a woman is judged on property grounds. If she's already married, the rapist is put to death. But in this case, if she's still a virgin, then the man is simply forced to pay her father and marry her. Interesting way of dealing with rape. And she's a young woman, you'll notice, because the legal age for marriage uh, in Jewish society was slightly younger than the age of puberty. So most women were either already married or committed to marriage before they hit puberty. That was the legal age for men, but most men were a bit older because they were kind of expected to be able to provide for their wife when they took them on. Um, so the gap that we now have between puberty and marriage of 10 to 20 years was completely unknown in Old Testament times. It's very significant. The use of prostitutes is simply mentioned in the Old Testament, presumably because it didn't complicate property matters. Here's some advice from Proverbs. A prostitute's fee is only a loaf of bread, so why would you have an affair with someone's wife, which is going to lead to him coming after you to kill you, when a prostitute's only a loaf of bread? Proverbs 29 does recommend against prostitutes, but only because they cost money, not on moral grounds. Being a prostitute, though, is a very different matter. And there's the story of uh, Tamar, which basically shows that good Jewish men slept with prostitutes, but good Jewish women were burnt alive for being one. If you know the story of Tamar, she dresses up like a prostitute, tricks her father-in-law into having sex with her, tricks him. When he's told that his daughter-in-law has been caught playing the whore and got pregnant, he tells her to be brought forward to be burnt to death. But then when she goes, ta-da, it's me, he realises that what he should have done was give her one of his sons in the first place so that she could have had a man and so she doesn't get burnt to death. So having sex if you're married is fine for blokes, but marriage is the only way a woman can have sex without being killed in the Old Testament. But not even all marriage. When the Jews returned to Jerusalem after the exile in Babylon, prophets like Ezra were horrified to discover that the Jews who'd stayed behind had married foreigners. And so they expelled all of the foreign women and all of their children from Jerusalem so that they could maintain the pure Jewish line. And uh, any men who refused to do so were banished uh, from uh, the community. So the Old Testament, the Bible, actually demands divorce in some circumstances, particularly mixed marriage. That shocks some people. Most people assume that the Bible is against divorce, but here's a case where it's in favour of it and, in fact, commands it. Even more people are shocked when they realise the Bible commands abortion. If a man becomes jealous of his wife and thinks she might be having an affair, she goes to the priest and he gives her a potion. And this potion is basically an abortificant. So she drinks the potion, and if she has an abortion, it shows that she was sleeping with somebody else, and so she's killed. If she doesn't have an abortion, it shows that she'd been faithful, and so the man is never allowed to question her loyalty again. In particular cases, the Bible uh, requires abortion. 
again, when men are worried about paternity. Homosexuality is what we always talk about in the Uniting Church when we say we're going to talk about sexuality, so I'm not even going to talk about it. You can read it in the PowerPoint later if you want to. So the Hebrew Scriptures assume polygamy, at least for the wealthy, condone having sex with prostitutes but not being one, recommend prostitution in preference to adultery, insist on female virginity but assume male promiscuity, makes men who rape virgins marry them, allows men to divorce women except in a few circumstances and insists on divorce in the case of mixed marriages and insists on abortion in the case of infidelity. So that's their ethic, their sexual ethic. The environment that that developed in was a small population with men dying in wars. The men owned all the property. Husbandless women were therefore vulnerable. Barren women were seen to be cursed by God. Uh, there was no protection from STDs, or at least not much, and contraception wasn't very effective. And the purpose of the law was to grow this small population into the kingdom of Israel. So contraception was uh, anathema, for example, and as was masturbation. To maintain the stable patriarchal society and to protect male property rights and women from abject poverty. To put it mildly, this list, I'm pretty sure, is somewhat at odds with what most people in the church would say was a sexual ethic that they would want to be encouraging anybody to follow. The point isn't to show how bad it is, the point is to show that it's an ethic that developed in a particular cultural context which has similarities with ours but also differences. Some of this biblical norm shifts when we get uh, to the New Testament. New Testament environment, smallish population still, more urbanised, less war because the Romans are kind of controlling everything but a lot more oppression going on. Men still owned all the property in the Jewish system but in the Gentile system women uh, had some autonomy. And of course the church moved from Judaism to uh, being a Gentile church. And of course Christians were called to renounce money anyway. Uh, Jewish women were still vulnerable if they ended up without a husband and barren women were still seen as being cursed. There was this growing and then fading conviction of the equality of women in the Christian movement. And if you want to read more about that, there's a booklet, Why Does the Uniting Church Ordain Women? that documents uh, what the Bible says about uh, women. And they thought the world was going to end very soon. So the purpose of life was to focus on this coming kingdom, to renounce property, to redefine community, to protect vulnerable women, and to focus on the kingdom coming. It's a different environment from the Old Testament one, so a different sexual ethic. Particularly when it comes to marriage. For Paul, basically, if you couldn't help yourself, then every man should get himself a woman and every woman should get herself a man. But it's a concession. Like, if you can't keep it in your trousers, then get married. But Paul wished everyone was single like he was. It is well to remain unmarried. It's better to marry, though, than to be aflame with passion. Hopefully married people have discovered that you can have passion in a married relationship as well. But anyway, this was Paul. If it has to be, you can marry. It's not a sin, but you'd do a lot better not to. How many of you have had parents or relatives uh, now or as you've grown up saying, oh, I really just hope you don't get married as you grow up? Like, please, please don't bring anyone home and introduce them to us. We don't want grandchildren. Please just remain single and celibate like Paul. Why was Paul on about this? Well, because the appointed time was growing short. Any day now, uh, the kingdom was going to come. And so if you were a woman, you could either focus on the kingdom or you could worry about what your husband wanted. If you're a man, you could either focus on the kingdom or you could worry about what your wife wanted. He was very equal. Men and women equally were called to discipleship and called not to marry so they could get on with following God because the present world was passing away. And Jesus, when his disciples say to him, oh, it would be better not to marry, he says, well, not everyone can accept this, but let anyone accept it who can. This idea that's come into the world that Jesus was kind of in favour of marriage uh, is a strange one. The fact that church has become the institution that kind of manages and administers and celebrates marriage is incredibly weird when you read the New Testament. Jesus was against men divorcing women, but that's for different reasons that we don't have time for today. Now these days, when we talk about the breakdown of the family, it's usually blamed on individualism or uh, capitalism or gay marriage. 2,000 years ago, it was Jesus. There is no one, he said, who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who won't get far more than that in this age and then eternal life. When asked to relate to his biological family, he said, it's the people that do the will of God that are my family now. Call no one on earth father and call no one master. Your only master and father now is God. 
Again, the church is the institution that's seen as being all about family values, which is incredible given what our founder or leader says about them. And Jesus undermined capitalism before it even began. If you don't hate your father, mother, wife and children, you're not worthy of Jesus, but also you can't be his disciple unless you renounce all of your possessions. Consider the lilies instead. Don't try and be like Solomon. Consider the lilies. So we've got Jesus, the guy that we all say we're following, demolishing the concept of nuclear family and biological family in favour of those who do the will of God, rejecting any kind of relationship with wealth or acquisition of possessions because the time is short. There's no point worrying about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. That doesn't sound much like the society I grew up in. It doesn't sound much like the society that I live in and maybe it's the same for you. We haven't taken on in the church, in the West, this New Testament ethic of family or of possessions or of resisting marriage. So we had the Old Testament relationship between men and women. In the New Testament, Jesus puts men and women on equal footing. He renounces wealth and inheritance, which was the big thing that was driving patriarchy in the Old Testament. And Paul continues that trend, but then it gets too hard. And so men are put back in charge. And that continued for most of church history ever since. Women, it says it towards the later part of the Bible, are the image of man. They should learn in silence and full submission. So basically just kind of shut up and get back in the kitchen. It's changing slowly again. We're recapturing some of Jesus' vision of the equality of men and women, but we're certainly not there. We're certainly not back to our uh, ancestral situation hundreds of thousands of years ago where men and women are truly equal and where possessions don't matter. But, you know, from the 1900s to the 1950s, women got the vote. In the 1950s, women had to work because all the men went off to war and when the men came back and tried to shove the women out of their jobs and back into the kitchen, some women said, well, hang on a minute, I can actually do that job. And so the push for women's equality in work started. In the 60s and 70s, uh, that accelerated, although there's still a long way to go. And there's been a trickle since the 1900s of churches actually letting women stand up the front and talk, although it's still very much a minority around the world. So in my world, men are pretty much in charge, but less so. Men and women are treated more equally, certainly than they were in the Old Testament times and probably in much of Jesus' time, but a lot less than by our ancestors. Property is still coveted by people, though. We haven't got away from this property. Inheritance is seen as an obvious right, isn't it? Like, I expect to inherit from my parents, and the law upholds that, whereas Jesus said that inheritance was basically a sign of greed and warned against it. The biological family is prized. I relate to my biological family more than I do to the church, probably. That's not true for everyone. And we accept the idea of masters, except we call them bosses now. So my world, my context, is kind of a mix of Old Testament and New Testament and even some of the pre-agricultural one. So we've moved from this 50s book, How to Keep Your Husband Happy, where it's no coincidence the woman is barely visible in the background. And uh, it's a, a Christian guidance book. And it'd be no surprise that the summary is basically make yourself pretty for your husband when he gets home, but not too pretty. Encourage him to go out with his friends while you clean the house and prepare the meal for when he comes back. And uh, make sure that his ego is well nourished and tell him that he's the most intelligent, uh, creative, etc. man you know, even if it's not true. That's the way to have a happy marriage. Now there's books about how to keep your wife happy, which is kind of encouraging, except most of them run along the lines of this one, when love and submission ignite, and basically say, if you're a man, the way to keep your woman happy is to be a man. Take authority in the relationship, get your wife to submit to you, make all the important decisions so that she can just relax and submit and get on with her devotions or whatever it is that she might do, um, and take charge in the bedroom and everywhere else. But there are other books out there, strangely enough, assuming that men and women are equals and that the path to a happy marriage is actually for two equal people to come together and push each other to be more and more honest about who they are over the decades to come. Passionate Marriage is a great book along that line if you ever want to read it. Won't worry about that one. Oh, actually, I'm doing better than I thought, time-wise. Maybe I will very quickly. Comparing the Old Testament or New Testament to today, just to reiterate a really important thing that we have to grapple with is the fact that uh, for our ancestors in the faith, they were married before they hit puberty, the women, and the men as soon as possible afterwards. And they were often betrothed even earlier than that. And because pu puberty was later then, um, because uh, diet wasn't so good and all those things, about 15. And their life expectancy was much more limited than ours was as well. Now we have a gap of 10 to 20 years between puberty and when most of us think about getting married. 
although uh, if you look at uh, churches, those churches that are more and more insistent that you can't have sex before you're married tend to have people getting married younger and younger. But generally speaking in our society, there's this big gap between when we become, when we can become sexually active and when we become married that is very, part of our very different environment from the biblical days. There's also a long period of single life after uh, divorce, if people get divorced, or widowhood, because people live a lot longer, uh, particularly women. So what about in your world? If this is a very brief summary of the world, what elements to all of these points in our history are different or similar for you? How equal are men and women in, in your world? So not the world, but the world in which you relate and live amongst your family and your church, your uh, workplace and so on. How equal really are men and women? How free are you to choose your mate? Did you get married at puberty or do you expect to? Are the consequences of having sex equally shared between men and women in your world? They clearly weren't in the Old Testament times, they were in the nomadic times. But what about now? That women have, do women have enough autonomy uh, in your world and enough equality that the consequences of having sex are equally shared? Remembering sex doesn't mean intercourse. We've had a very male-focused uh, understanding of sex in the literature uh, until about the 70s. Um, oh yeah, I, forgot, I left that bit out. Um, I'll stick it quickly back in. In, in most of the literature you'll read until about the 80s, uh, sex is basically equated with intercourse. But it's also uh, fairly well known, and especially now even better known, that between 70 and 90% of women don't orgasm during intercourse. Okay? So that means what's considered to be normal sex for most women doesn't lead to orgasm. Now you could say, well then there's something wrong with the assumption that that's the normal way to have sex, but instead of course all of the men doing the research decided that there was something wrong with the 70 to 90% of women, <laughs> all of whom were labelled frigid and neurotic. Interestingly, since the 4th century, um, increasingly in the medical literature you see an increasing frustration of healthcare professionals, this is 400 AD, uh, with hysterical women that come to them for treatment, uh, agitated, uh, they um, can't settle down into their uh, domestic duties that are required of them and the only cure that was found was uh, basically to um, stimulate the clitoris until they shuddered and then they were cured for a while. But more and more women kept coming back more and more often for this cure. So by the 19th century in the literature, doctors are incredibly frustrated by how much of their practice is taken up treating hysterical women with clitoral massage. And it takes so long and it's difficult to do and it's kind of awkward. And so they were the ones who uh, invented more and more mechanised ways of doing that job for them, which led to the invention of the vibrator, uh, which became the sixth best-selling electrical Implement. It was the sixth thing that came onto the market when people were able to buy electrical goods was the vibrator. Not just uh, for the clitoris, but that was certainly a big part of its purpose. So um, there was just another bit about female libido and about um, if you do find yourself in a couple and you believe that if we should do for others as we have do for them, if you're a bloke in the audience who likes orgasms, um, you might need to be creative in exploring how to help that happen for your partner. Um, I won't go into the stuff about masturbation. Let's continue, uh, except to say if you ate your cornflakes this morning, you'll be pleased to know you're probably less tempted to masturbate today. Cornflakes were developed uh, by Mr. Kellogg specifically to lower sexual libido and stop young people masturbating. <laughs> so now you can all watch what people eat for breakfast tomorrow and make your judgments about them. Okay, so this is the last slide. I shouldn't have said that, should I, if I wanted to wrap through. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's a whole other talk about uh, the control of women's libido through the control of masturbation and also men's as well, of course, uh, but less so because if the classic way, if the normal way of having sex is intercourse, then most men have an orgasm doing that. So most men have an avenue for an orgasm, but most women, 70 to 90% of women don't if you're not allowed to masturbate as well. Which kind of leads to questions around, you know, is female libido actually less than men's or would the tables turn if normal sex was considered something that didn't allow men to orgasm? So if men, if we all had sex for our lives but never got to orgasm, would that affect our libido at all? Anyway, questions about your world. How equal are men and women? How free are you to choose mates? 
do you expect to get married at puberty? Are the consequences of sex equally shared? Is the biological family still prized or is it rejected as Jesus rejected it? Is wealth still seen as a good thing in your context, in your environment? And do women have equal access to it? Or is wealth rejected as Jesus called us to reject it? Is marriage held to be a prized goal amongst your family and in your communities? Or is it seen as a concession and a distraction from the real work of the kingdom, as it was for Paul? Is it seen as something to be avoided, if you can, as it was by Jesus? In your community, is it seen that the world is about to end, or do you expect it to keep going on? So what is the environment in which you find yourself? How are you going to live a faithful, sexual life of discipleship in that environment? How will you love your partners as you would want them to love, as you love yourself? How will you do for your partners as they do for you? Will you have partners or will you have a partner? How will you walk the way of Jesus between puberty and marriage if you get married? And probably most importantly, I think, is your church a place where you can actually explore this aspect of your discipleship and even try to begin to start those conversations? And if it isn't, how can you make it one? In the meantime, how are you going to have those conversations? Not just with peers, although that's useful, but also with people who've had uh, a bit long, a bit more experience in the joys and pains of what it means to be a sexual being. I hope you'll find spaces this week uh, to begin to have those conversations, but also that you'll be able to have them in your communities as well. In the meantime, as you walk this path of discipleship this week and beyond, may God give you the serenity to accept the things that you can't change, the courage to change the things that you can, the wisdom to know the difference, and the humility and the courage to ask for help as you decide which is which.